So I was thinking tonight, earlier this evening as I was getting ready, and I said to myself, we are just people who study the Bible here at Living Way. You know, most people, they come and they will sit for a couple of services and then they say, man, you guys really just, you guys just come to church, you sing, and then you just get right into it. You just study the Bible. Yeah, there's not really much other to do. I mean, for what other reason are we going to gather, right? Other than to be in the word of God and be strengthened in it. But, you know, I was just so thankful for, you know, all the years that I've pastored and been able to to teach through the Bible. And it, it, it's a privilege to to be able to do this regularly, consistently, faithfully, and um, yeah, I, I always assume, you guys know I don't like assumptions, but I always assume that everybody loves the word as, as much as me. And, and, and in a sense, it's evident that, that, that some do, you know, but, but the encouraging thing here is the very fact that, you know, we come for this purpose. So it's like we come to hear from God. Amen. So I pray tonight that that's what we do, you know, just what we've always been. I just felt I had to share that, you know, because, you know, when you've taught through something like the book of Revelation, God only knows in my lifetime as a Christian how many times I've read through the book of Revelation, how much of it has been um, part of my study because, you know, the age of the church, where we are, the days we're living in, right? And then this is my sixth time teaching through this book in in almost 19 years of pastoring and so he's like what what else can you get out of this what how what other way right but god just shows more things more and more you know and it's like that reminder of the word that it, it's fresh it's it's there it's it's readily available for your faith to grow and increase so that's what we're going to do tonight we're going to grow in this so look with me here in verse 7 of chapter 3 and we're going to be looking at the context here of the church of Philadelphia. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, and he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. These introduction, these introductions really to the letter of the seven churches are really descriptions of Christ's power, descriptions of Christ's character. And as we've been looking, we see here that Christ is characterized by his holiness, by his truth. We see here by his authority. Now, remember, when it says to the angel... This is to, the Greek word is, is angelos, which actually means messenger, to the messenger of the church in Philadelphia. This is to the one who is leading the church. We believe the, the messenger is perhaps none other than the pastor, the bishop, the elder, the overseer. And so this is not only a word to a congregation, but this is a word to, to one who's leading a congregation, to one who, who is that mouthpiece, if you will, of God in this time uh, to the church. But Christ's message here to the sixth of the seven churches of Revelation here addressed in chapters two and three, the church of Philadelphia now becomes a recipient. There's not much said concerning the church of Philadelphia. As far as we don't hear of this church in the New Testament, we don't hear of you know, it's, you know, say work, if you will, like some of the other churches we read about. But the church is obviously a ministry that some believe that was perhaps founded or the fruit of Paul the Apostle's ministry in Ephesians or in Ephesus. And the church of Philadelphia is known for kind of its origin. The origin of the church is 
obviously the city of Philadelphia, let's look at it this way, was founded by um, a leader by the name of Attalus II, right around 590 B.C. And the birth of this city was the direct result of a devotion and a love for his brother. And so the city was called or founded with the word Philadelphia, derived of two words, phileo, which means love, delphios, which means brother. And this is why Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. And its origin has to do with that. It was, it was, it was a city that was known for a trade route or a mail circulation route that ran uh, really east and west. This is what it was known for. It was the way and manner in which um, this uh, city would be the route, if you will, to circulate um, these letters. Perhaps this is the route that the letters to the seven churches were circulated. And so Philadelphia, the city in and of itself, had its rich heritage in really... Um, its ability to, to be able to be a trade center, which is probably how the city survived. It was also a city that had many pagan temples, so there was idolatry in this city. And then around the year 17 AD, a massive earthquake historically leveled the city, destroyed it. And not too long after this massive earthquake, Tiberius, then rebuilt the city of Philadelphia. So it had its heyday, it had its time of lusture, of grandeur, then toppled over by an earthquake and the church that the Lord had placed there. Now remember that, that when a church is birthed in a community, in a city, it, it usually takes on some type of form, if you will, or some type of character of its community, of its city, whether the demographics of the city is you know, a certain group of people, a certain um, race of people, a certain age group of people. I mean, the demographics can, can vary, whether it is, you know, uh, wealth or lack thereof. And so a church kind of that God sends to a place kind of accommodates. It, it, it kind of begins to acclimate, if you will, with, you know, those type of needs. So the church begins to serve those needs. And it seems like the church in Philadelphia was acclimated to not only the needs in Philadelphia, but also the name of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It seems that the church would be known for its love. When you look at the church of Ephesus, they were known for their works, but what was lacking was love. They were a church that was rich in the church of Ephesus, a church that was rich in doing, a lot of service. And, and, and this is a good thing. When you begin to read the letter to the seven churches, it starts off with the church of Ephesus, right? And, and Jesus says, I see all your works. I see these things that you do, but I have this one thing against you. You have left your first love. And when we think of works, when we think of doing a work for the Lord, when we think of doing church, as we call it, if we're not led by the Spirit, if we're not doing it in love, then what are we doing? And if it's not fueled by what God, what God provides to do it with, then who are we doing it for? And this is where sometimes we, we miss the mark. We can get so caught up in works and doing and say, oh, well, uh, you know I love God. Look at what I do. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The measure of our love for God is not in how much we do or how much we have, but how much we obey and how much we humbly surrender our lives more and more to the Lordship of Jesus. And at the end of Paul's life, he, he says these words. He says, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, as he's reminding the church, as he's about to face, you know, this time, if you will, of, of going before the courts and ultimately would end in that 
Paul, Paul talks about his life being that, a drink offering. What does that mean? Well, you know, a drink offering was, was that which was wasted. He says in verse 17 of Philippians 2, Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering, as the sacrifice and the service for your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So notice that Paul says his entire life in Christ was lived for the benefit of others. So the idea is that ministry and serving the Lord is not southward. It is, it is for the benefit and service of others. And sometimes in our flesh, we wrestle with that. Because our flesh wants things for us, for ourselves. See, the church doesn't operate that way. The church is founded by one who, who gave his life for ultimately those who we'd reject Christ, spit in his face, rip his beard, beat him almost to the point of death, and then take and crucify him. And his prayer wasn't, God, handle them when I die, right? Or, Lord, you better get them. His prayer was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It was gracious. It was forgiving. It was... And the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, now this is talking about you and me, while we were yet in our sins, in our dead in our trespasses, Christ died for us. While we were haters of God, because that's what we were before we came to faith, right? We were haters of God. How many of you would be willing to give your life for somebody that hates you? Let alone do something for them. Usually, if someone demonstrates hate toward us, we, we, in a sense, kind of show dislike or same back. Our flesh is weak to these things. But you see, the church was founded on putting others before yourself. And this is why in this world, the way it is, people are kind of shocked when you go and you, as a believer, do a kind gesture. You do something nice, right? And they're why, why would you do this? And for the believer, we're kind of like, well, why not? We're supposed to do this. But when people tell you that, at least people within your sphere, within your little world, right? We all have our little world. It, it begins to show you and reveal to you how far bad the world is. And then people are, you know, impressed and blown away and taken by this. So Paul says, listen, if my life would be viewed or considered a waste, its entirety for Christ, all for the faith of one, let's just put it that way. Paul says, it's all worth it for me. Because it's not about how I look or what I've gained or what I've received. It's about who Christ is and the purpose and the mission in which he's called me. And, and Paul doesn't just take this and say, hey, listen, I'm the Apostle Paul, right? He's writing to the Philippians. I mean, we've looked at this on Wednesday night. And, and basically what he's telling the believers in Philippi is, you guys as a whole, the church, take this attitude. What would the Lord say to Living Way Fontana today? You know, the Church of Philadelphia is the most coveted church in the book of Revelation, in the letter to the seven churches. Every church wants to be the church of Philadelphia. They're like, hey, I like the letter to the seven churches. We're like the church of Philadelphia, right? I'm like, uh, wrong. <laughs> you know, but yes, we are. You know, it's like this is the one. Nobody wants to be like Ephesus. <laughs> we, we boast great things. We're loving. Look at what we do. It always goes back to measuring our love by what we do. We measure our love by how much we die to ourselves. We measure our love by who Christ is and not what we do. Amen? So, the church of brotherly love. <laughs> you, you know, this, the message from the Lord here was a word that would minister. This wasn't John's personal message to these believers, though he's the author of the book of Revelation. This is Jesus' message. And the message of Jesus starts with this characterization of who Jesus is. He is, he is holy and, and he, is, he is true. And Jesus has authority. So a great commission church 
sees Jesus as awesome, sees Jesus as holy, sees Jesus as true, and sees Jesus as sovereign. I love the word sovereign. I love the word sovereignty, especially when we read about the sovereignty of God. God's completely in control. There's nothing outside of his control. And you might say, well, man, if God is in control, he sure has a funny way of showing it. Look at the world today. Well, that's the reality of it, that in the midst of all this chaos, God has a purpose, God has a plan, and he's completely in control. Not even the chaos of this fallen world has distracted God, and even much so to say, as the prophet Isaiah says, I, the Lord, create light. I, the Lord, create darkness. I, the Lord, create evil. The word there, evil, in the Hebrew means calamity, that God allows calamity to serve its purpose in this fallen world. Acts of evil, we say things like, man, Mother Nature, <laughs> sheer evil with floods and earthquakes and all these things. And so then people start saying, you know, well, you know, God, you know, if God was a loving God, why would this happen? And, and we take our focus off God's ability to do. The earth is sustained. We're still alive. We're still living. And the earth will not be destroyed by Mother Nature. The earth will not be destroyed by wicked men. The earth will not be destroyed by evil. The Bible says the earth will be destroyed by God. So what does that tell you? That even in the midst of all the chaos that you're seeing in the world, God somehow is sovereign, ruling and reigning and enthroned in the midst of all of man's depravity. If somehow, some way, in our sinful way of thinking, we think that the depravity of man is too far beyond for God to do because man cannot save himself. Rather, the depravity of man is something that we should look at and say, God, because you are able, you sent forth your son. Some would look at this world and say, it's done. Let's, let's write it off. It's over. But God says, no, it's not over till I say it's over. So, so why such a fallen world? Why such a bad place, Pastor David? If God, why evil? Because in God's sovereignty, he created man with a free will. God didn't choose sin for us. Man chose sin for himself. Well, then if God knew that man was going to sin, why did God create us this way? Well, why would God create us any other way? If God created us any other way other than the way that he created us, he would not be a loving God. I'll give you a very simple illustration for those of you that are married. The beauty, the excitement the passion. <laughs> they mean like, I need some of that right now in my marriage. <laughs> the innocence, the love, the affection of getting on a knee and asking this woman that you've labored with for however long you've courted and saying, Will you marry me? And then they go through that thing. You know. They always put the hand over. <laughs> My wife did. And everybody sees it. It's like, oh, it doesn't matter where you do it. It's like other people that don't know you, they rejoice. It's an amazing moment, right? Now imagine if you went and you put a gun to their head and said, you better marry me or else. Whoa. Some of you are probably like, that, that's kind of how it happened. Huh? So, <laughs> 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 I forget sometimes, you know, our church is in the hood, so we got some interesting <laughs> stories. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but to force someone to, to, to make. Is that love? They're becoming your spouse because you force them to be what you want them to be. Now, let's take that with how God created man. When God created man, God didn't force man to be like God. God created man and gave him a fresh start. Created man in his image and in his likeness. As a matter of fact, God created man with everything he needed to succeed and survive and to be pure and to be right. But he also created man with the ability to choose. That is the image of God that man was created in. And what did man choose? It wasn't Eve that sinned. She was deceived and she disobeyed. It was Adam who willfully sinned. And that's why all throughout Scripture it says the sin of Adam when we know it was Eve. Because Adam chose to sin. It changed everything then why would God do that if God is so loving? How, if God knew, why couldn't he stop that? Because God loves us so much that he created us in his image and in his likeness. And man chose to live outside of that image because of sin. And now we live in this fallen world and God says, listen, I, there's still hope because God took care of Adam and Eve's sin after, the, after that, right? They covered themselves with fig leaves. Remember that? They, they try to hide their sin. That's why I always tell people, you can debate back and forth whatever it was. You know, a banana, an apple, an orange. It was a fig. The fig tree has always been a representation of the people of Israel throughout its history. They covered themselves with fig leaves. So God covers them with tunics of skin that he obviously had to get from an animal, that he obviously sacrificed there. The first sacrifice and the first blood that was drawn was so that Adam and Eve can be covered by God because of their sin. And you might say, man, all of that, and I always get that question, Pastor, why would God create man if he knew man was going to sin? When we get to Revelation chapter 13 in verse, we'll read it. You're going to start to see why God did this. 13.8. And the Bible says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Isn't that interesting? Slain from the found, underline that, the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Now turn to John chapter 17. Very quickly, keep that underline in your mental note there, John 17. And look at what the Bible says here. In verse 5 of John 17, it says these words. It says, O oh, now, O oh, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you, listen to this, before the world was. Some translations say before the foundations of the world. What is Jesus saying in John 17, 5? That he existed before he came as the babe in Bethlehem. Psalm chapter 2 makes it very clear. The sun has always existed. Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God, not El, but Elohim, which is the plurality of God, created the heavens and the earth. In John chapter 1, John says, Jesus created the heavens and the earth. In Job 26 and chapter 33, it says, the Holy Spirit created the heavens and the earth and man. Who did it? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That is the us, and let us make man according to our image and our likeness. So Jesus not only existed before the world was, 
But if we're reading Revelation 13, 8 correctly, Jesus was crucified and offered up as a sacrifice before the world was. You guys are sleeping on this one tonight. Now there's the answer to your question. If God knew that man was going to disobey and all this evil would enter the world and everything that we're seeing today, you know, God knew that it was going to happen. Why would he do this? Before the world was even created, Christ was already crucified. Boy, chew on that for a while. Okay? I, I've lost sleep over that. Like, man, Lord. God, you, you're perfect in all your ways. Right? So, so here, the perfect one is right in this church that by some estimations would be like, this is kind of the perfect church. It's the church of, of Philadelphia. <laughs> the one who is holy. Well, now we see why it says he is holy. Think about that. He's holy. He's, he's true. Jesus, in his own words, says he is the truth in John chapter 14 and verse 6. Whenever you see the terms the before a word or a statement being made, it's, it's what we call in the original language the definite article. So in other words, Jesus is the truth, the absolute truth. There is no other truth. Jesus is the truth. If it's not Jesus, it's not truth. This is why we went back to the, you know, those that did not hold to the truth. Remember, he rebuked one of the churches. He says, you did not hold to the truth. And remember, Pontius Pilate had Jesus in front of him. And he said, what is truth? And there's a battle for truth. Even today, there's a battle for truth in the modern church because the modern church has been taught a gospel of works. And you see it. I know people that come and they're like, oh man, I hear you're a pastor. I go to church and we start talking about Jesus and their view of Jesus is totally different than what I know Christ to be. And listen, they're not Mormons and they're not Jehovah's Witnesses. And I asked myself, God, how, how is this? We're reading the same Bible. Because there's not many teachers of truth. You see, truth is always challenged. It's never comfortable. It's always put on that chopping block, if you will. You got to be ready. You got to be sharp. You got to be consistent. You got to be faithful. You got to hold true to it. You got to keep it. And you should never waver from preaching the power of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you look at this and you say, holy, yes. Jesus is holy. Holiness is Jesus. He is true. Holy and true. We see this as a common theme throughout the book of Revelation. And what is the book of Revelation? Not revelations. It's one revelation, not many. The book of Revelation is a revelation of the person and work of Jesus. This is it right here. This whole book is speaking about Jesus, his purpose, his mission, his plan. The consummation of all things center on the person of Christ. Everything comes to a head in him. And we see this term holy and true. You're going to see it in chapter 4. You're going to see it there in verse 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Remember there in the book of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 6 in verse 2 is Isaiah experiences this vision of the throne room of God. Remember that? And he, he falls flat on his face and, he, and, and he's in this presence. And, and he says these words, woe is me for I am unclean and I dwell among people who are unclean. Isaiah wasn't known for being a man who was unclean, but he identified with those who he was prophesying to, his people. Kind of like I said, the church identifies with where they are, who they're ministering to. He says, for I am undone. In other words, he's like, I'm going to die. God's going to wipe me out because the holiness of God. Or remember those angels that are flying around that throne as he's looking. 
And they have six wings. With two, they cover their eyes. And with two, they cover their feet. And then there's two they fly with. Why cover their eyes? Because they dare not look on the majesty and holiness of God as they fly around that throne. An angel did that before. His name was Lucifer. And according to Isaiah 14, when he saw the throne of God, he says, I want to have my seat on that throne too. Ezekiel chapter 28. The Bible says there, he was the anointed cherub of old. It says you walked on the stones. You were, you were perfected. You were, it says, you were exalted, you were raised up, you, you were perfect, it says, in all of your ways. It's talking about Lucifer. And then these words hit like a dagger in the heart. Until iniquity was found in you. It was pride. He wanted to be like God. So those angels that cover their eyes know, hey, we've seen what happened. When did Satan fall? Well, you know, we know that he was already in the Garden of Eden when man was there. So it obviously happened before then. And that was his whole premise. I'm going to cause everything God has made in his image to fall. Fall prey to sin and be bound by it and... Sin and death will overcome them. And so all they have looking forward to their, to their lives on this earth is death. That's all you had looking forward to, you and I. But because Christ is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, the Lord was like, not so fast, buddy. These are mine. There should have been a hallelujah and an amen right there. But you look at this and you see here that then they covered their feet. Why is that? You kind of see this picture throughout Scripture. Remember when Moses went to the burning bush? What did the Lord tell him there in that theophany? God appeared to him. That was God, the burning bush that was on fire, not consumed. God revealed himself in a theophany, an appearance of God in the form of fire. And a, bur and a bush that was not burned. And this is what caught Moses' attention. This bush is on fire, but it's not burning. And then he hears the Lord as he speaks to him. And the Lord says, take your sandals off where you're standing is holy ground. You can see now why the seraphim that fly around the throne cover their feet. They dare to in any way present themselves as having the ability to stand in the presence of God. Nobody stands in his presence. He's God. See, sometimes we forget that, right? We, we come to church and we like demand God to do as we pray. And, you know, and like, you know, Lord, you should be happy I showed up. <laughs> this should be a time when we gather and we afflict our souls. Where we say, Lord, it's because of your goodness and your grace. It's because of who you are that we could even come and receive and come to church on a Sunday night. <laughs> after you've already attended Sunday morning. <laughs> For some of you, it's like, well, you know, pastor, you told us we had to if we weren't ministering. You should have that desire to. Because you want more. And then with the two other wings, they do their duty and they fly around the throne and all they say is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Why holy three times, holy to the Father, holy to the Son, and holy to the Holy Spirit? Blessed God, three in one. And you see here this picture and this image of God's holiness, and it clearly shows in the tabernacle of the Lord, holiness. The officiating of the priesthood, holiness. The sacrifices, holiness. On the turban of the high priest, it says holiness unto the Lord. Then from the tabernacle to the temple of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant, the sacrificial system, all of these things. Holiness. The tabernacle and the temple now coming embodied in humanity, wrapped in flesh in the person of Christ. Christ is holy. Christ is true. 
he who has the key of David. This authority of this sovereignty clearly teaches his rule. But notice what it says here. Who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. We always say that God opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors that no man can open. And this picture here and this idea of the holiness of God, the truth of Jesus and all these things are statements that are also spoken of about the Father. So we see here the work of the Father and the Son, kind of like where Jesus said in John 17, Father, glorify me that I might glorify you and, and bring me back to that fellowship that we once had. If God is holy, God expects holiness from the church. But as we've seen already, not many of the churches were practicing holiness. They were, they were given to the idolatry and the, and, and the pagan practices of the day. They were, they were wrestling with this thing. This reference to the key of David is really a, a messianic prophecy. Jot this down, Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 22. And the Bible says, And I will place on his shoulders the key of the house of David, and he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open open. Jesus is the one who does this. Jesus is the one who prepares the way. Doesn't he say that? John 14, 6, I am the way. There's the definite article right there. Not just any way, because not all roads lead to eternal life. All roads do lead to God but not to eternal life and not salvation. Because any road you take, eventually you're going to stand before the Lord God. And Philippians 2 says, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So if you take the road of prosperity, if you take the road of wealth, if you take, listen, you can take that road, you can travel it, but one day you're going to step into eternity. One day you're going to stand before God. The problem is, is you took the wrong road. You went the wrong way. The sad reality that many face when they step into eternity and it's there, realize that their whole lives they went the wrong way, there's no second chance. And they realized Jesus was the only way. Jesus is the only way to eternal life. He's the only way to God the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. The Great Commission in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, I'm going to read it to you. Jesus tells this to his disciples as he's about to ascend. You know, it's after the resurrection and Jesus kind of commissions them. And, and this is what Jesus says here in the Great Commission. Verse 19, Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So in other words, Jesus says this is what you're to be doing. You're to be teaching, you're to be preaching, you're to be discipling, you're to be sharing the gospel, you're to be ministering the word of God. And we talked a little bit about that this morning with the ministry of reconciliation. Remember that? But Jesus affirms the church, and, and, and here's the positive action. There's really no negative actions. There's no critique to the church of Philadelphia. He goes on to say in verse 8, I know your works. I see, notice this, I have set before you an open door. And no one can shut it, for you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. So he affirms their positive actions. I know your deeds. I know your work. See, he says, I've, I've set before you an open door that no one can shut. 
And I love that because to me, that's the reminder of all that we do for the Lord is because God wills it, you know. When you do a work for the Lord, I love when you can't explain how it all materialized. <laughs> that's when you know it's God. But the purpose of setting the door before them really is both really an admission into the kingdom and an opportunity for service in the kingdom. Christ is the only, he says it in John's gospel, I am the door, right? He says, I am the door. He's the way. Jesus opens that door and, and there's now admission through him into the kingdom. And he's commending the church of Philadelphia and saying this, that what you're doing is of the Lord. You, you are on the right track. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it. Sometimes we feel like we're, we're not gaining steam, right? We're just kind of like, oh man, what's going on, man? There's really no, you know, and sometimes we can get caught up in, in, in new people coming to the church. I've always asked, you know, do you have a card? <laughs> do you have a flyer? We've not had cards or flyer in the existence of this church. Because we want people to come here because the Lord's brought them here. Not because it's the next popular church with, we don't have, I, don't, I was going to say flashy things. We don't have flashy things. <laughs> What we have is what the Lord gives us to do ministry with, and we do it. What we do have, without a doubt, is the uncompromised word of God. Faithfully being taught over the pulpit. Jesus says, the Lord says, I place my word above my name. Imagine the Lord saying that I place my word above my name. In other words, my word is put in a place where you can count on it. In today's modern way of saying it, we would say, I swear by it by my name. If you have a good name and you're respected and you're admired, that's a trustworthy statement. Now just think about God. And he says that. So if God holds his word that high, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we be in this word? Shouldn't we be believing this word? Shouldn't we be growing in the word? Shouldn't we be taking points and looking at this? And, and, and this is it. He's commending them and he's saying to them, listen, you guys have done some great things. I've set for you this open door. And notice what he says here. That no one can shut it for you have a little strength. Sometimes it feels that way. After almost 19 years of pastoring, I'll tell you guys, sometimes it feels like, man, Lord, is this, whew, that doesn't mean I'm getting tired. It just means the reality of this life is setting in. I'm like, man, Lord, okay. You watch the ministry go through its, I don't know, its changes, its people, its over the years. And the saddest reality is the church is, is somehow dictated by, by man's feelings. When the church should always be directed by the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in tune with the spirit. And where does that come from? It doesn't come from some special praying and some special service and fog machines and laser beams and all this stuff. It comes from a life surrendered to the Lord. You know that the greatest work of the spirit in the church is not a hyper charismatic Pentecostal church service. That, that is a mixture of, of the flesh and an abuse of the gifts and just weirdness. Because if that's what the service is, it's, you're open for whatever. Hey, you know, we're going to bark like dogs. I guess God's moving that way now. And so there we are on all fours barking like dogs. I've been in those services. We're having visions and apparitions in the service. You know, there's gold dust falling from the ceilings and people are like, oh, all of a sudden now, he says, I'm brushing my teeth and I noticed I had a gold tooth in my mouth. <laughs> you guys are laughing, but it's true. It's weird stuff. It's like, where do you guys come out with this stuff? <laughs> We're already viewed as the world as being weird to begin with. This just adds to it. It's, it's crazy. Or the spirit of laughing, laughing in the spirit. <laughs> Anyways, let me stop with all that. 
But you know, you know what it is? It's Jesus says, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. The greatest work of the Holy Spirit in the church is when the word of God is being taught faithfully, rightly dividing 2 Timothy 2.15, the word of truth. So he says, I know your works. Guys, there's not one thing you do for the Lord that he does not see. Let that be a word of encouragement to all of you tonight. Don't serve God for the pat on the back. If that's the case, that's all you're going to get. Serve like Jesus served. Serve like the example that he gave in John 13. When he washed the disciples' feet. Now, I'm not saying go around and wash people's feet. And don't ask me if you can wash mine. But Jesus served his disciples. That's the picture. The disciples didn't go washing feet after this. You don't ever see nobody else doing it. It was an example that Jesus was giving. And when he says, I've given you an example to follow, it wasn't the foot washing. It was that Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to serve. And Jesus says, this is how the church is to live its, let's say, lifetime on this earth. It's not here to be served, but it's here to serve. And those that are of the church, the body of Christ, he says, I know your works. I see the things that you do. And take note, God sees everything. Hebrews 4, 13. There's nothing hidden from the Lord. I have set before you an open door. This is by God's doing. And no one can shut it. This is why I always say there's warfare, guys. When you're going and you're praying and you're seeking the Lord, why is there warfare? Because the enemy knows he can't stop God's work. Nobody can shut it. So the enemy is going to do everything he can to discourage you and hinder you from going forward and trusting God and trusting that God's going to do some great thing. And, and, you know, it might be over a period of time. It might be in a short period of time, maybe within hours, maybe within days. For me, it's been years. And the longevity of Christianity and the longevity of my faith in the Lord and even the ministry, you sometimes start to get comfortable. Not that any of you guys have ever struggled with being comfortable, but I have. You start to lose that that freshness. You start to lose that zeal and that spark. And it, now it just becomes, well, you know, we've got to go to church on Sunday. I mean, it, it's, 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 uh, I, I have to go and serve rather than I get to go and serve. You'll know when your vocabulary changes. And when your vocabulary changes, it shows what you've been taking into your heart because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When you put that word in there, the word of God keeps you sharp. When you study it, when you rightly divide it, when you dissect it, when you hold it in the regard that you're supposed to hold it in, when you understand that it's about the Lord and his doing, and it's a privilege to serve God, it's a privilege to walk with Jesus. Listen. It's true. God opened this door. And nobody can shut it. All the gates of hell will come against you. Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 16, right? But he says the gates of hell will not prevail. They'll be present. It'll be warfare. But it will not overcome you. Why? Because no one can shut that door. Can you imagine the encouragement to the church of Philadelphia? You ever been on your last string and you're like, this is it. It's done. It's over. I think all of us have at one point in time. Maybe that was, I don't know, I wasn't there. (laughs) But I'm assuming that God's always on time, isn't he? Imagine this letter coming at that time where they're like, "This this is too much. All this paganism around us and we're preaching the gospel and... And the enemy's like, ain't nothing happening here. So what does he do? He encourages them with a few things. Number one, the Great Commission Church is faithful to the gospel. And notice what Jesus says. He says, be persistent. You have a little strength. In other words, don't give up. You have strength. Might not be a lot. Doesn't matter. You still have strength. Be persistent. Do not give up. In other words, he says this too. You've kept my word. Be ready, be energized, be mobilized to go and evangelize and share. You'll be surprised. 
as to how many people are really willing to receive, especially, guys, if you're worried about where this world is going, just read the rest of the book of Revelation. You're going to see. But anyways, don't worry. God's in control. So what do we do in the meantime? Take as many as we can with us. The Bible says he who wins souls is wise. You might waste your Christian lifetime trying to become a Bible scholar. I, I, I'm, I'm past all that, guys. I, I really am. I wanted the, the PhDs and the masters and all these things. And, you know, God has a way of making all those things happen. The other day, me and my wife were sitting in the office and, and I was showing her. Degrees that I already have. You guys don't know. Everybody's like, oh, Pastor Dave, you, you know, you, you didn't make it past seventh, eighth grade. And that's true. I didn't. When I went to prison, I got my GED. You really have nothing else to do in there but, but read. Didn't realize I liked to read until the Lord used that occasion for that. And for what purpose? Then the Lord opened the door for me to get an AA degree. And then the Lord continued to grow my education in that area. I teased my wife and I says, you know, really my title is Dr. David Zamora. She says, really? I says, yeah, it's right here, look. Doctorate of Divinity. We go to seminary, check it out. I loved it, but it was stuff I already knew. And I started realizing I can exhaust my entire Christian life trying to chase these degrees that really are just pieces of paper saying that you've been accountable to someone that you're reading the Bible and that you know what you're reading. And it's funny because, you know, going into this seminary that, you know, accepted me in their Masters of Divinity program. That's what I got accepted into, their MDiv program. But I took the Masters program because everybody else that was taking this course was only accepted in the Masters. I was accepted in the MDiv. And you know where the acceptance came from? They listened to hours of my sermons. And you know what they said? It sounds like you've already been to seminary. I says, no, man, I just love the Bible. And, and we would sit in these class, and one of the brothers here was with me in the class, and we would look at each other, and he's just kind of like, Pastor, you taught us all this stuff already. We know this already. We've read this. So you can exhaust your entire time going by this and saying, hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to get that, and you can miss out on what the Lord has. And then, you know, they're kind of like, hey, you guys coming back? It's like, we just have too much ministry to do. I don't need a certificate or a degree to show that I'm a student of the word. I just need the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit and surrendering of my life to the word of God. And that ultimately, whatever I put in my heart, you guys are going to hear because it'll come out when I preach over this pulpit. So what am I trying to say don't go to Bible college. Don't go to, you know, seminary or any of those things. No, yes, do it. If that's what you want to do, do it. Pursue it. It's exciting. Trust me, it's worth the experience. I don't know about the price, but the experience, yes. And you might say, well, how did you get to that? I'll be honest with you guys. The Lord made me a reader before I was even a believer. I hated school. But I fell in love with the Bible and devoured it and read it from cover to cover multiple times. Nine years straight in my Christianity, I read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Every year, I just picked a different translation. You name the translation, I've read it. And I just began to teach the word. I just began to devour the Bible and teach. And, and a library of two books grew to a library of about 5,000 books exhausting just reading and studying and reading and and by the grace of god there's something else the lord did not only did he give me a love for reading he gave me a, a photographic memory 
and I retain everything I read. And so I'm like, oh, that's good. Here's the problem. <laughs> I'm getting older now, and I know I'm still young, but I'm getting older now, and it's like my brain doesn't work like it did when I was in my 20s. And I'm reading now, and it's kind of like, where did I read that at? It sounds like something I read before. Where? And so now I'm wasting more time, not wasting, but more time given to finding out where that is. Now, I know the almighty Google is just one touch away. But I look for it myself in the word. And I still carry my Bible and I still read from my Bible. And nothing against you who prefer Bible apps. You lose your ability to work through a Bible. When you're given one, it's like foreign to you. You don't know how to work through it. This word is living. It's the word of God. And here, I'm working through two Bibles, the same one. It's just one is old notes, and this one is new notes that I've, that I've put in my Bible here to carry this. This is it. The Lord opened this door for me, and so what have I done? I've stayed in that. Have I wrestled with getting outside of that? Yes. Have I tried to shut it on a couple of occasions? Have I not been persistent? It's happened. But he also says here, and you have not denied my name. In other words, he says, be true to the name of Jesus. Notice what Jesus does in this letter. Verse 9, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Now, I, I use myself as an example in this. What has God called you to do? For me, it's the teaching of the word. It's obviously a gift of God. And at any moment, this gift can be gone. The privilege of pastoring this church. There can be any other man over this pulpit teaching the word. It doesn't have to be me. It's by God's grace. And what has God given you? What door has he opened up for you? Like the church of Philadelphia. You might have little strength. Listen, strengthen that little strength. Refine it. You know, over the years, if you, you listened to me teach when I first started teaching, it was... It was you know, the brother that oversees the radio ministry and he's editing these messages and sometimes he goes in the archives and he, he gets a kick out of it. He's like, man, Pastor, you, 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 you sounded different. I says, well, obviously I was younger. This is almost 20 years of teaching the Bible and being recorded. And no, oh, he goes, the things you were saying and he'll repeat phrases and say things. And, you know, it's just him joking with me. But he says, you just taught different then. I says, yeah, because I believe different. Your theology grows. You grow. The teaching now becomes a little bit more in-depth, and you start to see things because you're, you're spending time with the Lord, and, and the more time you spend with the Lord, the more you grow in the Lord. And, and let's not even make this about falling off because the more time you spend with Jesus, the more closer you draw to him, the less the temptation to fall off is there. It's when you lack those things, you're weak. Because God's not. What has God given you? What, what, what has little strength? What, are you, what is holding on by that thread? And listen here, the Lord is just encouraging you like he encouraged these believers. And, and what is he saying here? Well, he condemns the enemies of the church of Philadelphia. He goes on to say here, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan. In other words, be encouraged by the hope of vindication. Guys, our day will come. We will be vindicated by God. Who are those of the synagogue of Satan? He explains it right here. Who say they are Jews and are not. It's a work of the enemy. And there were Jews who were infiltrating the early church. The same happened with the church at Philippi. The same happened with the church at Corinth, right? Right? These elite, these super apostles came in and they begin to lay down these rules and tell the Gentiles, you can only be a true Christian if you go get circumcised. Wow. I thought Christ died for our sins. 
That plus circumcision will make you a true follower of Jesus. Synagogue of Satan. This is why I say, guys, <laughs> the gospel of works, Jesus plus something else, then you're saved, will only lead you to a life of Christianity that is weighed down with the fear of, I can lose my salvation. Because somehow you're taking credit for the work of salvation in your life. Whereas the true gospel of grace, you never question losing your salvation. You know it's by the grace of God and that alone, it's his work and not yours. And the last I checked, God is not an Indian giver. He doesn't give you something and take it back. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.13, Ephesians 4.30. And who's powerful enough to break that seal? You can't. That's so encouraging, amen? amen. Now you're kind of like, okay, this is good. I got some momentum now. <laughs> yes, this is really good. And he's encouraging them. And you could imagine this, this injection of faith and encouragement in their spiritual bodies. And he says in verse 10, behold, you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. This has been a very contested verse here. But the verb here, to keep, the idea behind this verb is followed by a preposition. The preposition is keep you from. Or the preposition from can also be out of. The verb keep, the preposition from or out of, the hour of trial. What is the hour of trial? It's talking about a period of time. And remember, guys, listen to this. Who's in view here? A word against the enemies, the unbelievers. And he's encouraging the church of Philadelphia, listen, I will deal with your enemies. I will take care of them. So the hour of trial here is dealing with these fake Jews who say they are children of God, but they are of the synagogue of Satan. And and here's where we support or find the support for what is known as the pre-tribulational view of the rapture of the church. The Bible says that we will be caught up, harpazo. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. In the Latin translation of 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, it's the Latin word raptus, where we get the English word rapture. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we will all be transformed. Jesus said in John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Jesus ascends. The disciples stand there gazing as Jesus is ascending after the resurrection and the angels appear to the disciples and they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing in the same manner in which you've seen him go? You will see him come again in the clouds of glory. Christ will come for his church. And what is the hour of trial? It's also known as as what the book of the prophet Jeremiah calls it, the day of Jacob's trouble. It's a time in which God will afflict Israel. In Daniel chapter 9, in, starting in verse 24, you have what is known as the 70 weeks of Daniel. 69 sevens have already transpired. And we just read in the book of Genesis, the story of Laban, right? And his son-in-law, Jacob, and how Laban duped Jacob for Leah. He was supposed to get Rachel, and he got a sister that wasn't so good-looking, right? And Jacob is then told by Laban, his father-in-law, fulfill your week. 
Work another seven years for Rachel and I'll give her to you. The first time a week is referred to as a week of years rather than a week of days. We call that law of first mention in the Bible. The 70 weeks of Daniel are weeks of years, not days. And 62 sevens is 483 years. And you read Daniel, read those verses there. Verses 24 through 26. And you'll see Christ's first advent. Then you'll see his second advent. Then you'll see the time of the Antichrist. And then you'll see a time, a period of judgment. And it's interesting that in that prophecy, the angel tells Daniel, this is pertaining to you. Daniel was a Hebrew slave in Babylon to your people, the Jewish people and your beloved city. Their beloved city was Jerusalem. He never mentions the church. And he says there's going to be 49 sevens that are going to take place. Or excuse me, seven sevens that are going to take place. Which equals 49 years. And he says it's going to start at a point when a decree or a command goes forth, he says, for the rebuilding of the walls. The only story in the entire Bible that deals with the rebuilding of the walls is the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah so happened to be governor of Judah for 49 years. Interesting, right? March 14th, 445 B.C., King Artaxerxes gave the decree and the command for Nehemiah to go and rebuild the walls at Jerusalem. Those seven sevens passed, and then 62 sevens came for a total of 69 sevens being fulfilled. And then the Lord said, when that prophecy takes place, then Messiah will come. And he will be offered up. He will be killed, but not for himself. And if you take the totaling of that, seven times 69, 483 years, from March 14th, 445 B.C., takes you to April 6th, 32 A.D., what happened April 6, 32 A.D.? Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem the very day. There's the Messiah. He's come. And that happened on Palm Sunday. And Jesus would soon be cut off, but not for himself. Well, what about the 70th week? 69 have already been fulfilled. Well, the only other time we see a period of seven years is known as the Great Tribulation found in the Bible. That is the 70th week of Daniel. Why is this important? It's very important because I believe what's being taught here is a pre-tribulational view of the rapture of the church. We will not go through the tribulation because the tribulation or the 70th week of Daniel does not pertain to the church. It pertains to Daniel, his people, and their beloved city. The church will be taken out. And there's a promise here. I will keep you from the hour of trial. That's the tribulation. And notice what else he says that will come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. You should underline that. Because there's a pattern here. The church is on the earth right here. And as we go through the rest, the lukewarm church and what and how God's dealing with the church is the final seventh church, the church of Laodicea. Listen to this, guys. After this. The church will no longer be on the earth. In chapter 4, the church now is in heaven. And the church will be in heaven all the way till you get to Revelation chapter 19. And you see the church coming back with Christ to rule and reign for a thousand years. Where's the church from chapter 4 to chapter 19? In heaven. And what's happening on the earth? The great tribulation starting in chapter 6, the seven-year tribulation period. where finally the Jews will see Christ for who he is at his second coming. After the seven-year tribulation, Christ will come again, not by rapture, but coming to this earth a second time because the second coming is that. It's not the rapture. And as Jesus places his feet on the Mount of Olives and he reveals himself to Israel, finally they will say, who did this to you? They're going to see the scars and all that he endured. And he's going to say, you did and they will finally call him their Messiah. Isn't that amazing? What an encouragement. 
Do you not feel like the church now of Philadelphia? Man, we're just holding on, Jesus, till you come and take us. Be persistent. Be energized. Be mobilized. Be encouraged to share the gospel. Be true to the name of Jesus and be encouraged that the Lord God will vindicate you. And he says, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast. Wow. Hold on. He's coming. <laughs> that what you have, no one may take your crown. You know, sometimes it's something as simple as that. Some of us are going to have crowns for all the people we've led to Christ. Some might have more than others. Ultimately, we get the same gift, the presence of the Lord. But you see the point that he's making? Don't give nothing up. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. The Great Commission Church lives not only by the power of God, but by the principles of God. And Jesus will protect them according to his purpose and his plan. And Jesus will come soon. And he encourages them to stay strong. And Jesus will honor the church, giving them a home and a new name. And Jesus challenges them, hold true, stay to the promise, hold fast to what you have. Don't give nothing up. I always say, church, hold on because we're almost home. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches.